going to hit uh, record right now. Um, so uh, my name is Monica McCubrey and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist for the Nebraska Game and Parks here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, thanks for joining us today on our fifth installment of the Science of series. Today we're going to be talking about wildlife diseases. So it's kind of an under talked about topic uh, just because I'm sure a lot of you guys or people have heard about some of these diseases but we're going to get a little bit in depth about which ones happen and occur in Nebraska and how that affects wildlife populations and um, a lot of different things that come along with that. So uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. It'll probably be a little bit shorter than the last couple if you have joined us for the last couple of weeks. Uh, so if you have any questions you can go ahead and talk to my co-host. I'm going to let her introduce herself. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us again on these on this amazing series. My name is Amber Schiltz. I'm the Wildlife Education Program Manager of the Fish and Wildlife Education Division here at Nebraska Game and Parks. And Monica will be doing um, the presentation. She'll be doing an excellent job as always. I will just be here as a moderator. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to use the chat um, as we go along. I'll be moderating that and I'll be doing my best to answer your questions as we go. However, we will be stopping um, throughout the sections of her presentation um, to answer those questions in more depth and to let Monica know some of your questions. But if you have any, um, as they come up, we encourage those questions. In fact, we love it. We love the discussion that they bring. So definitely um, use the chat feature to ask those questions. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Amber. And again, like she said, if you guys have any questions, just let us know. We're pretty informal throughout the whole program or whole presentation. So if you have questions, we would love to answer them or try, at least try to answer them. And there will be a question and answer period at the end. So awesome. Well, I will go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully it likes it this time. It just kind of does a weird thing. Um, where I need to stop and reshare and put it on slideshow mode and then reshare it again. So we'll see. All right, and now I got to find this stop share, share my new screen because nothing's easy. All right, there we go. Hopefully you guys don't see presenter mode. You see that it looks good, there. Monica. You okay, can. perfect. All right. So like I said, we're going to be talking about diseases today. So um, we're going to go over some diseases that you might have heard about before that are pretty common, but then we're going to go over some that you might never have heard of before. Um, if you joined us last week for the science of invasive species, I covered a couple different ones that we'll also talk about today, um, which are the same topic. They're very important wildlife diseases um, and they can be invasive as well. So we'll go ahead and go through those. Um, one thing I did want to do first. I want to talk about what a disease is. I'm sure all of us know that word, we've heard that word, but when you break it down, what does that actually mean? So according to the Wildlife Society, a disease is defined as any change in the normal function or structure of any part, organ, or system of a living body. So basically it's something is wrong with your organs, your system, or your living body. It's something is not uh, functionally right. Um, another um, definition that the Wildlife Society also has is a pathological condition occurring in a susceptible population. So it is something that happens to a population that is maybe not thriving the best to it could, or um, there is an environmental change, or something is happening where that population is more susceptible now. And we'll talk about those things about why some populations are more susceptible to disease than others. Um, so diseases can affect a lot of different things. They can affect the reproduction of animals, survival, fitness, abundance of wildlife populations. Um, it is especially hard, and we'll talk about this too, um, for populations such as T&E or threatened and endangered species. So they already have a hard time because their populations are low, their habitat is changing, they're very um, not as resilient as some animals. They can't come back from things as easy or as quickly, um, so they're more susceptible to diseases or it is with limited abundance. Um, sometimes there's animals that, that come and go and, and are extinct before we even know about them. Um, so a lot of the times when we do catch those animals and see that there is something wrong with that population, we can oftentimes say, well, this was because of disease or this was because their population was small. Um, so how do we know what drives that disease? How do we know what makes more populations more susceptible than others? Well, 
a lot of different things. Um, host populations, invasive species, environmental changes. I won't read every single one because I know that you guys can all do that. Um, but there's a lot of different things that cause and drive disease. Um, a few huge ones are increased interaction with humans and wildlife, baiting, um, long distance transport of pathogens. We kind of talked a little bit about that if you joined us last week about invasive species. Um, so all of these things really drive disease and it doesn't in fact help it at all. Um, there are four main reasons about why we should care. Um, what does it matter if some mouse population goes extinct because of a disease? There's a lot of things that affect us as people and our environment and our economy as well. Um, so the four main reasons that we're going to really talk about why this matters is wildlife pathogens can infect humans. So we all know that there are some diseases that um, both humans and animals can in contact from each other. And with us being more close to wildlife than we ever have in the past, this is causing issues. This is causing problems. Um, also, some can, uh, diseases can affect the health of our domestic animals. So if you have dogs or cats, I'm sure that you've taken them to the vet before to get vaccinations. That's good. Please keep doing that. And we'll talk about why that's so important and what diseases you're protecting them against too. Um, and it also affects wildlife populations. Um, so a lot of the times you will notice that there's smaller populations, there's larger populations, and those drive is driven by disease a lot of the times. Um, and they also might have important effects in the ecosystems and their functions. So not only does it impact a certain species or a certain group of animals, but that certain group of animals or that species impacts that ecosystem and that function. And we use that ecosystem and other animals and um, organisms use that E ecosystem as well. So it's a huge kind of circle when we talk about disease. It's not just affecting one species. It affects ecosystems. It affects the whole area. It affects a food chain. There's lots of different reasons. So you, we should care about them. So how do certain um, populations or ecosystems fight off that disease. Well, one thing I do want to point out is that disease is fairly normal. Um, it's part of the natural world. It's happened um, for many generations and there's nothing that necessarily we could have done about that. It's a normal function of an ecosystem. It's just sometimes the um, quickness that they evolve. It is the amount of species that they infect. It is the amount of um, contact between humans and wildlife, but it is a normal part of the environment. I will, I will have to say that. Um, there's lots of viruses, bacteria, and fungi and parasites that cause disease in ecosystems. Sometimes they're more impactful than others, and sometimes we don't even know that they're there. Um, wildlife and ecosystems have evolved defenses over time that help fight off that disease. Um, it usually takes generations and generations to do that. Sometimes they do it fairly quickly. It's just we're seeing now more diseases than the faster than they can um, fight them off. So we have that balance issue. So how do we keep a good natural world? How do we keep um, diseases out of things? Genetic diversity and diversity of species are a huge thing. We need lots of different species and different animals and areas, and we need good genetic diversity. That means they have more chances of fighting off that disease. Um, also, what if a species is lost to a disease? More than likely, there's another species waiting to take that niche and to fill that niche after that animal has gone. And again, that species diversity is something that we really need. All right, so we're going to go through um, different types of wildlife diseases. We're going to go through some different categories. And again, this is only a 30, 40 minute presentation. So there's a lot that I'm missing or might have missed or just didn't bother to cover this time. Um, so if I see something that you, or if you see something that I missed, please let me know. Um, but otherwise, we're just going through um, some common, more common ones that you might hear of or see. All right, I don't think any comments or questions yet, do we? Okay, perfect. All right, so here's a big one. I'm sure a lot of us have heard of this. Sometimes we call it CWD, chronic wasting disease. So this is something that is in Nebraska. Um, about 99% of the stuff that I will talk about today is something that has either occurred in Nebraska, has the potential to occur in Nebraska, or something we have seen in the past. Um, so chronic wasting disease infects our cervids. That is our deer, our elk. We don't have moose in Nebraska, but they are in that same family. Um, so what does it do? It infects the brain and the nervous system of the infected animal. Um, how do you know if something has CWD? Well, a lot of the times it's very slow developing. You might not even know that the animal has it. It might appear very healthy. Um, a lot of the times what happens is it makes the animal kind of behave irregularly. Um, they exhibit neurological irregulations. Um, they appear emaciated or starving. Um, they just don't look 
correct. They don't look right. Um, but it's very slow developing. And a lot of times those animals, because of that irregular behavior, they either get eaten by a predator, they get hit by a car, um, they get hunted because they're more easy prey, if that makes sense. Um, it's just causing their body to not react right. And um, they, they face then those consequences, unfortunately. So um, chronic wasting disease is something that has been found in Nebraska. It's been here since 2000. Um, we first found it in Kimball County. And if you're wondering, um, rifle season for uh, deer is coming up here in November. And every single year we do um, CWD, CWD testing. Um, as far as this year, that uh, image on the screen here is where they decided to do them this year. Um, but since 1997, we have been testing for deer. Now it hasn't been found here since 2000, but we started testing even before then. So of the 55,000 deer that we have tested, the 280 elk that we have tested, 815 have become positive and 14 elk have seen positive. So it's a high number, but in the grand scheme of things, 55,000 deer and only 815 have tested positive. It's still a good number, but it's not rampant through Nebraska. Um, 49 counties out of 93 have detected uh, CWD in those free ranging herds. Um, but there has really been no population decline because of this, or that, not that we have seen. Um, I hear a lot of people during rifle season say that, oh, the number of deer is going down or the number of um, deer that we are seeing has been really low this year. Why is that? Is that because of CWD? Um, not that we have found. Um, maybe you're just not seeing them. Maybe the habitat's a little bit different. There's a lot of different things that could cause that. Um, so we will be testing for this year in uh, white-tail deer and mule deer. And some people have asked me before, does it affect people? So if I um, hunt a deer and it has CWD, if I eat that meat, what's going to happen to me? There's no strong evidence that um, the occurrence of CWD um, that we can get infected. The only way that we could is if I would eat that infected CWD meat, but we don't have the strong evidence yet that anything's going to happen to me. Um, not saying that I would want to eat that um, if I can avoid it. So if you are concerned, you can always get it tested. Um, in certain areas, you can always call Game and Parks and say, should I get my meat tested? And they will give you an answer. Yes, you maybe should or no, you shouldn't. So, all right. Another deer um, disease here, sometimes people call it blue tongue, we call it EHD. So it's a long um, acronym for epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Um, so this one is actually transmitted from um, white-tailed deer and mule deer mostly. Um, cattle can become infected, but they rarely die from it and is not known to infect humans. Um, a lot of these diseases we just aren't sure. Maybe they infect humans, maybe they don't, but at this time we can say that this uh, EHD does not infect humans. Um, so it mostly occurs in the late summer and the early fall and there's these tiny little biting what we call midges that um, carry the disease, they bite the animal, the animal behaves irregularly, and then they go to bite another deer. So they cause high fevers. Sometimes these guys look really healthy um, and you wouldn't even know that they have EHD. Um, so the only true way to tell is if you require or if you take a sample of their lymph nodes and or their blood um, and then you can figure that out if they have it or not. Um, a few years after the flood in 2011, if you remember that big flood, um, we had a lot of deer populations go down. We think maybe this was one of those reasons. Um, it makes deer really thirsty, so they would go to a water hole and um, they'd usually die at the water hole. So um, they can get, um, they can become infected with it and then come out totally fine. They can live. Um, one of the telltale signs was when you looked at their hooves, you can see little breaks in their hooves. Their hooves are just like your fingernails. So if you see little lines, sometimes scientists would say, oh, that deer probably had EHD sometime in its past because of those weird marks on their hooves. So it was kind of interesting to hear that. All right, um, another one that we, again, deer, um, if you're hearing like a theme here, deer. Um, this is called bovine TB or tuberculosis. So this is a really um, progressive chronic, so long time, um, bacterial disease that cattle and deer be can become infected with. Um, so when people hear the word cattle, they think is my meat infected or is my milk infected? So when people first found this, they did not pasteurize their milk. Um, that heating of the, um, of the dairy products to kind of um, break down all those bacteria. Now that we do that, our milk is safe to drink. So even if your milk comes from a cow that has bovine TB, you're totally fine. 
It's typically found in the lungs, and this is a very slow growing disease. Um, this is some um, lungs that came from a cow. All those little abscesses on it, that is a telltale sign that this animal clearly has something wrong with it, and that's called bovine TB. Um, it can take years to develop. Mostly what happens is it starts in the lungs and then moves on to the chest cavity. So it could be spread from deer to deer. It could be spread from deer to livestock, from livestock to deer. Um, like we said earlier, deer and people and wildlife are more closely um, close to each other than they ever have been. Um, so that kind of um, prevent some or causes some problems for wildlife and for people. All right, if you joined us last week, this is one that we talked about. Um, it is what we call an invasive pathogen. It is not originally from Nebraska. So white nose syndrome is caused um, by the fungus Geomyces destructions. Um, so this is a little white fungus that grows on bats, um, usually starts in their muzzle or their nose region and then moves throughout their body. Um, it causes skin erosion, abnormal behavior, Basically what happens is that when they go to into torpor or not a true hibernation, but go to sleep for the winter time, um, they develop this disease because they are so closely compacted to each other. Um, it's mostly found in cave dwelling bats or roosting bats because they're so close to each other and that's how they transmit the disease. Um, it depletes their fat storage and it makes them wake up during um, when they should be sleeping and they burn all their fat reserves. So by the time spring comes, they don't have any more fat reserves and they end up dying. Um, so this is first confirmed in Nebraska in 2015 in an old abandoned mine in Cass County. Um, it was first ever found in New York City in 2007. We believe that it came from Europe and then it spread through that bat contact. Um, about 80% of the declines in our bats um, in the Northeastern United States have been from white nose syndrome. So it's a serious disease. It's affecting our cave dwelling, our roosting bats. Um, we don't really know a lot about it either. It's a fairly new disease. So scientists are still trying to figure out how we can prevent this. All right. This one is very common. I'm sure all of you have heard about rabies. You might have even gotten, hopefully, if you have a dog or a cat, you vaccinate them for rabies. So this is caused by a virus that affects the central nervous system of any mammal. So not your reptiles, not your amphibians. These are mammals. Um, the virus is usually transmitted through a bite and the saliva in the bite. Um, the interesting thing about this one is if you get bit, it's not an instant thing. It could take one to three months to for that incubation time. So it can move through your body, it's moving through your nerves, it goes all the way up to your brain. Um, it's a huge public health concern because it can be submitted and transmitted between people and wildlife. Um, so if your dog for some reason would get rabies and would bite you, it can transmit across species. Um, Good thing though, is that rabies has actually declined in the United States because people are vaccinating their animals, um, their domestic animals, which is good. Um, but with more exposure between wildlife and those domestic animals, it's ever more important to vaccinate them. So if a wild rabid raccoon would happen to bite your dog and your dog was vaccinated, your dog is hopefully 99% gonna be fine. Um, the major reservoirs for this disease, like we talked about, mammals, raccoons, coyotes, skunks, bats, foxes. And when I say bats, people give a really bad reputation for bats for having rabies. They are no more likely to get it than any other mammal. And the statistics on this are less than one tenth of 1% 1 of rabies or bats that have been uh, tested, have tested positive for rabies. So it's still a very small number. So rabies, um, what will happen is that it moves along the brain or moves to the brain along the nerves. And there's two different phases of rabies. Um, there's something called furious rabies, which is that abnormal behavior. It's, they're excited. They seem to lose fear. Um, a lot of the times when you see an animal come up to you and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a fox right next to me. Um, that animal could have rabies. That's not a normal behavior for that animal. Um, furious rabies can then turn into what we call uh, dumb rabies. I did not name these, but dumb rabies, um, where the animal has that loss of coordination, paralysis that leads to coma and death. Um, usually, um, within one to 10 days after becoming what we call dumb rabies. Um, the treatment, there is none. Um, once you're infected, there's a 100% chance um, that it's fatal. Um, supposedly three people in the world have survived and had it. I'm not sure how accurate that is, um, but you have a greater risk exposure um, 
if you don't vaccinate. So people that are more likely to become infected, um, veterinarians, healthcare workers, um, wildlife biologists, you can get those pre-exposed um, vaccinations. So then if you were for some reason to get bit by a rabid animal, you would be protected against that. All right, um, canine distemper. So this is one again that we, um, uh, vaccinate our normal or our domestic animals. Um, this one really occurs in wild and domestic carnivores. So our animals that will only eat meat. It's highly contagious. It affects a lot of different types of species. But one good thing is, is if um, an animal usually gets this disease, um, if they recover from it, they build that lifelong immunity so they can never get it again. Um, wildlife that contract it have a high mortality rate. So if they do get it, the odds of them surviving and having that immunity are extremely low. But but it does happen. Um, a lot of species that are affected, it's going to be dogs, coyotes, wolves, mink, you can read all those animals. Some marine mammals have even gotten it. Um, the problem is in dense populations. So um, black-footed ferrets, not that we have a lot of them now, but at the time when we had a lot of them, um, they were close together and it's very easy to contract that and transmit it. Um, it's usually transmitted through the infected uh, respiratory droplets or from your oral cavity or the eyes. So again, a way to prevent this is to vaccinate your domestic animals. All right, mange. Uh, this is one that we've seen a lot in our coyotes and our foxes here in Nebraska. It's a highly contagious skin disease that's caused by mites. There's three different kinds, the one that's called sarcoptic mange. There's one that's called demodetric mange and then notoetric mange. So um, just depends on the host. The noto one is with squirrels. Demetric one is through deer, white-tailed deer, elk, and then the sarcoptic could be anything else. Um, it's led to huge declines in fox and coyote population, mostly reported in those wild canids. So fox, um, jackals, uh, coyotes, domestic dogs, lots of different things. It causes hair thinning and loss, and they get these smelly, gross crusts on their skin. Um, and one thing that I didn't even really think about when I first heard about this is that, okay, so they lose some of their hair big deal, right? Well, what happens when it gets really cold outside? They don't have hair to keep them warm, so they can freeze to death. What happens when it gets really hot outside? They get sunburned because they don't have that hair to protect their skin. So it's a lot of different things besides just losing a little bit of hair. All right, um, this is another one that um, you can vaccinate your animals against, and a lot of people have never even heard of this one. It's, we call it lepto for short, but we call it leptospirosis. Um, so it's a zoonotic disease, which means humans and animals can both contract it. Um, it's usually infected in domestic animals or wild animals, but it could be potentially fatal, but it's not something that you really wanna deal with. It's what we call an emerging disease. So what happens was that um, an emerging disease just basically means that it's coming up again. It's emerging. Um, so what can you do about it? You can vaccinate. That's a huge preventative measure. Um, people that become infected, you either become infected by um, touching or being around or breathing in animal urine from an animal that was infected um, or swimming in contaminated water. Um, the floods last year in Nebraska, this was a huge issue. Um, there's a lot of water. There's a lot of gross stuff in the water. They said, don't go swimming. Don't have your animals go in puddles. It was because of this huge reason, the lepto reason. Um, it's mostly in mammal species, cattle, pigs, horses, um, but rodents can have it too. White-tailed deer, raccoons, foxes, skunks. There's a lot of different animals that can carry it. Uh, you get fever, loss of appetite, depression, de dehydration, vomiting, nothing fun. All right, the plague. Everyone freaks out about this one, um, but with modern medicine, there, it's pretty effective at treating the plague. We've all heard of the plague, the Black Plague. We had this issue back in Europe. Um, it killed a lot of people. Um, so our reptiles, or sorry, our rodents <laughs> still carry this disease. Um, so a lot of humans and mammals can get it. Um, humans are normally infected by being bitten by a flea that is carrying the bacteria or by handling an animal infected with that bacteria. Um, I have a picture of prairie dogs here because prairie dogs are known to carry the bubonic plague. So don't go touch prairie dogs. Um, today, like I said, with modern medicine, if it's preventative, you find out something's wrong, you go get taken care of, the odds of you surviving are very likely. Um, with modern medicine, we've, <laughs> we've come a long way. Um, but rodents, wood rats, squirrels, prairie dogs, chipmunks, voles, rabbits, um, if you were watching the news, 
think a couple months ago, there was a squirrel in Colorado that was uh, detected to have the bubonic plague. So it is something that it's not this ancient history disease. It's still around. Uh, we just don't hear a lot about it. But it's just that continuous cycle of fleas and animals and fleas and animals going across and across. All right, so that was a lot. That was a main um, chunk of my presentation is mammals. Um, mammals carry a lot of diseases because they have a lot more going on than in their system than other animals. So I'm gonna turn to Amber really quick here. Do we have any questions or any pressing matters or anything? Um, Heidi just said, thank you for standing up for bats. So that's good, of course, Heidi. We're always here to stand up for bats. Good, I, I love my bats, so. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, well, we'll go ahead and move on then. Um, we're gonna move on to amphibians next. So again, if you joined us last week, um, one of them that we did talk about with amphibians and that invasive species was chytrid fungus. So if you've been hearing about this and you have um, been listening about our amphibians, they're highly declining. We have very few amphibians left. Um, and what we think is causing a majority of this decline is this chytrid fungus. So um, I'm gonna call it chytrid. There's this long fungal name that I'm not gonna embarrass myself by trying to say, um, but this is that we call it chytrid for short. So basically what is happening, it's this emerging disease, although it depends on who you talk to. Some people think it's been here a while, um, but it infects the amphibians keratin skin skin layers. So what it does is it makes the skin of salamanders, frogs, toads, any amphibian very thick and they are not able to absorb oxygen or water or minerals or vitamins or through the water or anything. So when you can't do that, you die. So it commonly infects their skin and a telltale sign that you know that these animals have it is that weird discoloration or thickness and hardening of their skin. So if you look at this frog here, um, the legs and the arms are pink. They should not look like that. That is not normal. Um, so we know something is wrong with that animal. Um, once a place is infected, so if a pond or a lake or something, it can stay in the water forever. It never goes away. That's why we always tell people when you go from one lake to another, make sure you clean your boots, make sure you clean your boat. Um, those, that's just a preventative measure for spreading these, this disease around. Um, they've been here for a long time. A lot of people, depends on who you ask, but some herpetologists believe that it's been here quite a long time um, since the world was a world. It's been here in the United States, but with climate change and increasing water temperatures, they believe that that's caused the disease to kind of wake up, and now we're seeing it more than ever. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting, bullfrogs are immune to this disease, which doesn't help because bullfrogs are everywhere and they eat lots of native species, um, but they apparently cannot get chytrid fungus. Um, they've been in waters with chytrid, they, they do just fine, but other animals like leopard frogs or um, um, any types of leopard frogs, <laughs> I'm totally blanking on my frogs right now, Cope's gray tree frogs, anything, they apparently, they're very susceptible, but bullfrogs are not. All right, we don't have a lot of amphibian diseases, but again, we might not know a lot about them. Um, we're gonna move on to reptiles. Do we have any questions about reptiles? I think we're good. All right. Um, so the only reptile one that I have talked about um, is snake fungal disease. So we sometimes call it SFD. Everything in the biological world has an acronym, so why should it this? Um, but this is called another emerging disease, infectious disease, so it's coming about again. Um, it infects our snake species. So recently, about 23 states, Nebraska is one of them, we have um, reports of this disease. So these local, um, what's happening is it, it thickens the skin, it causes abnormal abscesses, Basically, it's what happens when the reptile or the snake will hibernate somewhere where it's too wet. It causes a fungus. Um, it's usually around their mouth area, but it can go all the way down their back as well. But it, you can definitely tell that the snake does not look normal. There's that facial disfiguration. It's abnormal shedding. Um, usually what happens though, um, when we have found snakes that have this, after they shed maybe 20 times, they shed that off and they're okay but that's if the snake is taken care of. If for in the wild, they might never lose this. Um, so we think that environmental conditions are what's causing the number of cases to increase. It's more wet, it's more humid, it's more hot. We have um, climate change. There's lots of different reasons that we think that these diseases are coming about. All right, again, there's not a lot of wildlife uh, like reptiles and amphibians ones. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to birds. 
All right, so salmonella or salmonosis, um, it's one of the most widely distributed diseases of humans and animals. Um, a lot of times I hear people when I take uh, reptiles or amphibians into classes, they say, watch out, you might get salmonella. So it's very, very low chance, but it is always a good thing to wash your hands after touching animals. Um, you can also get it in birds. So about 2,000 different types of salmonella are out there. They have been found in reptiles, birds, and mammals. Again, it's a little bit lower of a chance when they come up to reptiles, um, but it's a lot of times found in songbirds. So that's interesting because songbirds, there's so many of them, they form dense colonies, and a lot of the times they hang out at feeders. They hang out at water baths or bird baths. So a lot of times they contract it and they transmit it from each other very easily. Um, humans can contract it as well. Um, a lot of the times, you know, if you go out to change your um, bird feeder or you go out to change the bird water in the bath, um, touching the feces on there or touching where the birds have been sitting, it can definitely transmit it. Not as high. I don't think a lot of people grab it and then touch their face or touch their mouth or anything. It happens. Um, you do it accidentally. But again, it's always just a good um, preventative measure to wash your hands or wear gloves if you feel more safe doing that too. So um, a lot of the times when animals have this, there's that rapid breathing. They have fluffed feathers. They look lethargic. Um, they're shivering. Um, there's a lot of different types of this. So it kind of depends, but these are just kind of the main common symptoms of that. All right, so I had some other ones in there. There's like avian influenza and there's something called duck plague. It's not a huge issue in Nebraska. The avian influenza has been found here, um, depending on what kind you're talking about. The H5N1 has not, um, but now we're gonna go ahead and move on to some other things. All right. Lyme disease. Again, another very common one. This is a tick-borne disease that can infect humans and some domestic mammals. Um, so wild mammal or wild animals and birds, they're asymptomatic reservoirs. So asymptomatic, you might have heard a lot lately with um, the coronavirus. A lot of us, they say we never show symptoms, um, but you can still carry it. That's the same principle here. Um, so animals might never show symptoms that they have it, but they still can be carriers of this Lyme disease. Um, it can be really severe or mild in humans, depends on how you're bit, how long, how infected that tick was. It just, there's a lot of factors there, um, but it causes joint pain, heart issues. It can affect the nervous system. Um, it is currently the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. Um, in the eastern part of this, the country, this guy, the deer tick, the picture that I have here, is the most common vector of this disease. So they're the ones that are usually carrying it in the eastern. If you go to the western part of the United States, it's a different type of tick. Um, if you find out that you have it um, and you're treated fairly quickly, antibiotics can address it. It's not usually a huge deal. Um, might have some pain, might not feel the best, but you can recover from it and still be fine. All right, another one is West Nile virus. Um, so another common disease, this one's primarily in birds um, that affects the central nervous system and they're transmitted through the bite of a mosquito that is carrying that virus. Um, humans and other mammals can become infected, um, but we are what we call dead end hosts. So if I become infected with West Nile, I usually don't um, host it and then and give it to somebody else. I just get it and then I'm done. Um, so 80% of the people that are infected with West Nile, they never show symptoms at all. Those 20% though, they can show symptoms. Um, a lot of the times those mosquitoes, the most susceptible birds are gonna be crows, ravens, jays. If you know your thing about birds, you know that they're all kind of in the same family of each other. Um, so it can be submitted though, transmitted um, from people to people through like organ transfusions, blood transfusions, or if you are pregnant, um, it can transmit to the, to the fetus as well across that placenta. Um, the loss of coordination, head tilt, tremors, weakness, lethargy, lots of different things um, that come along with this West Nile virus. All right, um, just a couple more here. This one is with our fish species, mostly including yellow perch. So heterosporosis is a parasite that will infect and deteriorate the muscle tissue of the yellow perch and some other fish species. Um, the parasite will actually create sporocytes um, where the spores will then develop. Um, we originally think that it came from Europe and Asia. So it is what we call an invasive pathogen. It's an invasive disease. Um, the clinical sign is if you ever see a yellow perch and they have white and or opaque 
colored skin. Something is wrong that is not normal. Um, so they probably have what we call heterosporosis. So why is this disease such a big deal? Um, basically what it does, it just makes them more susceptible to predators. So if they have this parasite, they're less likely to evade predators. They're less likely to be able to forage. Um, there's lots of different things, but uh, we found that yellow perch are the most affected species, but it doesn't mean that's exclusively yellow perch. Um, as of right now, it is a potential uh, inv invasive species. Um, it is not yet what we call established in Nebraska, but we also might not know about it. Um, so it could be here, but we have not officially established it as an invasive species or an invasive pathogen here um, at this time. All right, another one um, is called the whirling disease. Um, this one I thought was super interesting um, just because it, this is a parasite and it has this huge weird life cycle. So it is engulfed by what we call a tube effects worm, which is called the intermediate host. And then it morphs into a free floating phase. So it floats throughout the rivers or the water, whatever, and then attaches to a host fish. Usually it's something within the trout and the salmon family. So we do have trout in Nebraska, so this is an issue. Um, that parasite will then penetrate the head and the spinal cartilage and um, of the baby trout or um, the young trout, we call them fingerlings, and then it multiplies and it puts pressure on the organ that helps you stabilize your balance. So people always think your balance is in your legs, or your arms, it's not, it's in your brain. Um, so it causes the fish to swim erratically. So we call it a whirling disease. It also prevents the fish from eating and evading predators. Um, it's really hard to evade a predator when you're swimming in circles. So um, it, it usually causes death and it's not good if that animal has this. This is the thing that I found super interesting is that this parasite is able to survive freezing temperatures and it can survive in the water without a host for 20 to 30 years not days, months, years. So it can sit somewhere um, calm and dormant for 20 to 30 years until it finds a suitable host and then it can infect that host and start this whole cycle over again. Um, we believe that it was introduced um, from uh, Europe into, I think Europe and Eurasia, um, imported trout in the United States. So if you are familiar with our trout species. Um, some of them are not native um, and we believe that they were introduced somehow and this disease kind of came along with them. So um, all of these things that we talked about today, those introduced species, climate change, um, interaction between human and wildlife, those all can kind of thrive on disease. All right, so that was it. A um, little bit shorter this week if you join this last couple weeks. Um, next week we have the science of fungi. So please join us. We're going to be talking about the structure of a fungi, what fungi we have in Nebraska, should you eat them, should you not eat them, um, and just kind of some cool anatomy things about fungi. All right, so the next three weeks. Next week we have one on October 8th, and then we have what we call a bye week. So um, we have nothing on October 15th. And then we'll start again on the 22nd with snakes um, as we get kind of that spooky Halloween thing going here. And then on the 29th, um, Science of Nebraska Fish. Um, my coworker and our aquatic education specialist, Grace Gard, is going to join us um, along with Daryl Bauer, who is our um, fisheries kind of education person um, in the fisheries division. He's going to join us as well. So it should be really interesting. We're going to talk about some non-game fish in Nebraska. All right, so thank you very much. Um, please remember to join me next week for the science of fungi. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and see if we have any questions. Oh, Monica, we just had one, a comment from Barry Marsh and he mentioned when you were talking about, um, I can't remember which disease it was, West Nile, I think. Yes. But he's noted a significant decline in crows, magpies, blue jays, and great horned owls supposedly from the disease northeast and central Nebraska. Um, I do remember reading about that and learning about that from Joel Jorgensen, who's our non-game bird biologist yeah, with agency yeah. as well. Um, the latest that I remember hearing is that the at least the the magpies in the west and the blue jays in general have slowly come back a bit, but they did take kind of a dive in like the last 10, 15 years fish from that West Nile disease. Um, and I do remember actually working out in Western Nebraska anytime um, we, I worked at a zoo, for example, and anytime we had a dead uh, magpie on the grounds, we were actually supposed to send it in to be testing for West Nile. So that's kind of interesting. So yeah. thank you for sharing that, Barry. And then um, 
Ruthie Stearns asked, curious when Lyme disease showed up in Nebraska. Do you know that off the top of your head, Monica? I don't know it off the top of my head. I assume that it's been here a while. I remember being a kid and hearing about it. And, um, but I mean, I, I wasn't a disease nerd, so I don't exactly know when it started, but I assume that it's been here a while. I can always ask one of our um, biologists here in Nebraska, Game of Parks as well, and figure that out too. Cause yeah, I just, I don't know that off the top of my head. And one thing, and that's a good question, Ruthie. One thing to note um, on, on, that, on that note is, I'm not sure exactly when it showed up, However, um, one, unfortunately, one of the implications of climate change, specifically in Nebraska, is some of those diseases that are um, insect-borne, invertebrate-borne, or tick-borne like that, unfortunately, will probably only get worse or more prevalent. And that's because um, suppression of that disease really relies on a hard winter that we're used to in, in our state, right? So we need that killing frost. We need that super nice cold winter to kind of um, you know, kill back the population of insects. And that's the cycle of things. Well, unfortunately, as things kind of heat up and um, and that winter gets shorter and shorter and we have um, warmer temperatures, the season and the, the life cycle of, of those uh, disease carrying insects like, or invertebrates like ticks is only going to expand. And unfortunately, along with that um, comes increase in disease. So not to leave on a, a bad note, but that's just an interesting component of how everything is connected together, even with climate change and disease. Yeah, thanks, Amber. And a lot of people don't even realize that either. They don't ever put two, to, two and two together that climate change and disease are anything closely related to each other. So that is always something good to remember. And like you said, yeah, unfortunately, we might be seeing more, um, not only of those invertebrate and tick-borne diseases, but also things like um, this whirling disease that showed up or the heterosclerosis stuff. So, um, and who knows? <laughs> no one saw this pandemic in five, five years ago, and who knows what's going to happen again in five years. So um, also, I put... I put in the chat, and I can put it again if it got buried a little bit, um, but I put, as of right now, you can find the recordings of this series on OutdoorNebraska.gov backslash online education. And just a cool note, we are um, getting a new, a new page for, the, for a lot of our wildlife education resources that we're producing from our wildlife um, education division here. And so for now, you can find them on that website. Um, but hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll have a brand new, it's still going to be OutdoorNebraska.gov. We'll have a brand new page that's easier to navigate with a lot of, um, with the Science Up series and many more um, really great resources that are coming out of the Fish and Wildlife Education Division here. And when we, when that goes live, we'll share that with you. But for right now, if you look at the chat, um, if you click on that, you should be able to see past recordings and uh, future recordings of, for example, this one and the ones that Monica will do in the future. Awesome. Yes, thank you, Amber. And like she said, that online education page won't disappear. Um, we will just have a whole new area to put some stuff on there. So both will still be there, um, but everything will kind of be moved towards that wildlife education page. So awesome. Well, um, that's all I have. And if you guys have any questions, um, please let me know. I'll stick around. Me and Amber can stick around for maybe a couple more minutes. Um, but otherwise, thanks for joining us. And hopefully you guys will um, we'll see you next week at uh, same time, three o'clock, and we're going to talk about fungi. We might even have a fungi and join us. I don't know. We'll see. I heard one of my coworkers laugh, so that's nice. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hey, Kathy. I have her on mute. Yeah. Oh, hi. Okay, I'm on mute no. now. How are you guys doing? <laughs> hey, Kathy. Good to see you. You too. Thought I would uh, turn myself on here. <laughs> so, what have you been up to? Hey, did you get out to the bird banding station? Uh, I got out there early, like the second or third week, but I haven't been out there since. Um, it seems like the weekends, the weather's been awful. The wind's been blowing like crazy. Cool. But yeah, they, they caught a lot of stuff when I was out there. But the weather has not been very good. Yeah. One week left. Is that all? It's hard yeah. to believe it's October already. Yeah, I know. Okay, well, it was good to see you guys. Yeah, thank you. Talk to you later. I enjoy your Facebook stuff. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay.